Yeah, I gotta go. I gotta go. All right. I got. No, no, mom. No, mom. It wasn't the actual devil. I don't think any of us sit in the studio thinking, making decisions based on what is gonna get us one of these. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey, and I use my degree in sociology and psychology my certifications in criminal interrogation and body language analysis, and over 10 years experience as an award-winning mentalist to teach people practical psychology and behavioral analysis on stages and television shows all over the world. This week we are looking at the 2023 Grammy Awards because it's such a great occasion to see real emotions, some really positive moments, and a few not so positive moments. Now the reason I wanted to focus on something mostly positive this week, and there was so much positivity at this event, is because I feel like lately my content has been very you know, picking things apart and who's hiding something, who's being deceptive, that doesn't look right. And I just wanted to do something where we're looking at real facial expressions and body language of positive moments. Because I feel like we focus so much on what looks off that it'd be nice to look at what looks right. So we're gonna be looking at three acceptance speeches this week. It's going to be the one accepted by Kim Petras and Sam Smith, uh, Beyonce, as well as Harry Styles. And we're gonna be looking at what is going on with Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez. Just a quick heads up, every time in this video that a winner is announced and they get up to walk towards the stage, the audio is going to cut. It's gonna be muted. It's not your device, it's not the video. It's because in that moment they play their music and it's protected by copyright, I can't use it. Uh, so I'm just gonna be muting it. But there's nothing to hear. Anyways, no one's really saying anything. We're looking at the facial expressions, the body language, the emotions, so you're not missing anything. That being said, let's dive right in, starting with Kim Petras and Sam Smith. Unholy, Sam Smith and Kim Petras. Okay, so a lot going on right there with just the announcement and the walk up with both individuals. So for one thing, I wish the camera had cut to them just a little bit earlier because I have a feeling we would have seen something a little bit different on the face of Kim Petras because by the time it cuts to her, we're seeing the end of surprise. And I'll tell you what I mean. Surprise is a universal emotion. In other words, research has shown that pretty much anywhere in the world, surprise on someone's face, genuine surprise, looks the same and people can recognize it as being the look of surprise. What surprise looks like is things open up. Just the, the eyelids, the upper eyelids open up, the eyebrows go up and the mouth opens up. And what's happening is when something surprises you, your brain is shocked for a second and it needs to take in information to know how to react. So your eyes open up, your mouth opens up for extra oxygen in case you need to react, you need to run or something like that. This is the freeze fight or flight response being triggered. And your eyes open up and there's actual research that shows that when the eyes are open, we take in more information in our peripherals. So basically, your body is trying to get as much information as possible. But here's the thing about surprise. Of all the universal emotions, it's the one that lasts the least. It's the fastest one. With other universal emotions, it's very common to see them held. For example, you might be having a very happy moment and you might hold that smile as you keep communicating with that expression of happiness. Same with anger. You might be angry and you might be arguing with someone and that anger is held on your face and you keep going, so it's held. Sadness is the same, disgust is the same. Surprise is different from that. It doesn't last long. It lasts a couple of seconds, but in all my years analyzing behavior, I've never seen someone hold surprise while they keep interacting. So you're not gonna see someone walk into their surprise party and go like this and then walk around going, oh my God, this is so nice, uh, so good to see everyone. Uh. Like it just, that just doesn't happen, it's not a thing. So here we're seeing that surprise fade away because the mouth is open, but we could see those eyes aren't open. I have a feeling that when it was announced, they probably shot open like this for a second, and then she came away from that, but the mouth is still very much trying to get that oxygen because she's still dealing with this surprise. Surprise typically turns into another emotion. Here, obviously, it's turning into happiness. The other thing we see here is that she mouth blocks twice, once with one hand and once with both hands. And mouth blocking is a behavior that we see from our very, very early ages. Even in children, when children say something that they're not supposed to say, like someone's secret or a swear word, it's very common for them to 
bring both hands up like this and block the mouth. It's because they're trying to keep something in. Like, oh my God, I shouldn't have said that. They're trying to take it back, trying to keep those words in or prevent themselves from saying more. But it also happens with emotions. When we don't want emotions coming out, we're trying to hold those emotions in. So very commonly with surprise or with sadness, when the mouth opens, we see this kind of blocking of the mouth. Now there's quite a bit of debate as to why we do this, block our mouth or block our face in moments of emotion. Uh, but the most popular ones that I subscribe to are, first of all, to hide a vulnerability. So when our mouth is open, something could fly in there and we could choke on it. Like the body knows that it's vulnerable. So we kind of shield this open vulnerability. So physical vulnerability. The second one is social vulnerability. It's not to our advantage in most cases to let people see our weaknesses. When we're feeling surprised off guard or sad or negative emotions, because of the way we evolved, we know that sometimes if you show that, it could be taken advantage of. So we still have that reflex of blocking our vulnerabilities and blocking our face when we're feeling negative emotions or vulnerable. And the third theory is simply politeness. The same way we might block our mouth when we yawn, we just know it's rude to have your mouth open in public. So we just, when that happens, do that out of politeness, social politeness. So whether it's physical vulnerability, social vulnerability, or politeness, this is a reflex that we have. What do you think it is? Let me know in the comments. Which of those three do you think is the reason we might bring our hands up when we're surprised or sad or our mouth hangs open? Now, as they stand up to go on stage, we see a lot of confirmation glances from Kim Petras towards Sam Smith. She's new to this. She doesn't really know how this works. She's obviously overcome by emotion, whereas Sam Smith is a seasoned pro. They've done this a thousand times. This would be their fifth Grammy Award. So, Kim Petras is looking for those cues, like, what do I do? Where do we go? And this is the moment where we see just how much of a pro Sam Smith is and how much control they have over their environment, over the space that they're in. It's brilliant. The initial reaction is happiness. We see a genuine smile there, and we're gonna talk about genuine smiles just a little bit later, so I won't spend too much time on it now. We see that the fist, the, that yes gesture like this, and Sam Smith gets up, and Kim Petras is looking over to them for social cues. What do we do? She keeps looking like, what's the right thing? Sam Smith signals, let's go. And now watch what happens. Kim Petras is moving slower because she's sort of taking her thank yous and shaking some hands and giving some hugs. Now, Sam Smith doesn't want to upstage her. They don't want to be the first one on stage and take that spotlight. They've done this many times before. They want this to be Kim's moment. So watch what happens. They kind of stay back and keep an eye on Kim to check how far along they are on their journey to the stage. And it would be so awkward for Sam Smith to just stand there and be like, come on, Kim. Like, so notice what they do. They just start dancing in place. It's fun. It looks like they're celebrating their win. But in reality, this is a conscious decision, I believe, to allow Kim Petras the time to get ahead, to be the first one on that stage. Focus is on Kim Petras, that's what Sam Smith wants in this moment. This is further demonstrated by the fact that when they do get on stage, Kim takes the center stage and Sam goes around, does this big U-turn to land further back from where Kim is. And there's this kind of joyful hop in Sam's uh, step and kind of a very happy tone to this, but they purposely land further back. This, it, it's, it's so gracious. They want this moment to be Kim's. And it's even reflected in the fact that for this acceptance speech, Sam Smith doesn't say a thing. Sam graciously wanted me to accept this award because I'm the first uh, transgender woman to win this award. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'm so... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Okay, so Kim is obviously nervous here. I think anybody could pick up on certain cues in, in her voice and the cadence, the way she's speaking, and obviously she'd be nervous. This is an amazing moment for her, an amazing moment for her community. Great accomplishment. And she's up there, and one of the main things that we see here is, specifically when she starts talking about being the first transgender woman, we see two things. One is pelvic distancing, and one is pelvic blocking. So I get that there's a mic in front of her, and that you know she needs to talk into the mic and it's a little bit lower than it should be, but there are moments throughout this speech where she just tilts her head down or approaches the mic, but in that moment, we see the pelvis back up. And this is something we see enormously often on television shows where someone is presenting and they're nervous. In fact, this is a very common behavior we see on Shark Tank. 
Shark Tank is a terrific show that I love to watch to analyze real emotion, real behavior. And very often in nervous presenters, we see a very classic pose where they're standing and they're trying to be engaging because they've been told to engage the sharks. But instead of being confident like this and speaking like this, they tilt their head forward, but because they're nervous, their, their pelvis backs up like this and their arms are swinging like this. And this is a very common posture we see on Shark Tank. Now with her, it's not happening held for very long at all. After all, she is a performer. There's enormous confidence to her. This is just a moment that she's feeling self-conscious. So we see that pelvis back up for a second and both hands go down and block this area. So as human beings, we're one of the only species where our reproductive organs and vital organs are completely exposed. So in moments of vulnerability, we tend to hide or block them. And that's what's happening over there. She's feeling a moment of vulnerability and we catch it in that moment. Meanwhile, we have Sam Smith who's yelling at the audience, get up, get up, stand up, come on. This is the time to get up. And there's almost this very authoritative vibe of like, get up. And at the end, we see something that we've talked about many times on the channel where their head turns away from the audience with this, the mouth opens for a quick sec like this. And we see the head going like that. Now this gesture where we turn our head and open the mouth is something we talked a lot about while I was doing analysis of Amber Heard. It's something she does a lot where she kind of turns the head and we see this kind of thing. And usually this is a very dismissive kind of annoyed thing. Like when we're in a situation where we're kind of, you know, this kind of thing. I think that in this moment, Sam Smith's a bit impatient with those people who aren't standing up. Like this is a time to stand up. This is further emphasized for me by the fact that after that gesture, we see their head doing this no thing. And this no gesture is often associated socially with one of four things, all of which begin with DIS. So it's disapproval, disbelief, disagreement, or disappointment. And I think in this moment, we're seeing a bit of disappointment and disapproval from Sam Smith, basically saying like, get up, get up, come on, can't believe people aren't getting up for this. So I think there was a moment there of impatience and disappointment, like, come on people, let's, let's get up here. And then we're going right back into positive stuff. And I just want to thank um, all the incredible transgender legends before me who kicked these doors open for me so I could be here tonight. Um, Sophie, especially um, my friend who passed away two years ago, who told me this would happen and always believed in me. Um, thank you so much for your inspiration, Sophie. Um, so there we're seeing a different amount of confidence when she's talking about other transgender legends before her. We're not seeing that distancing. In fact, we're seeing very open body language. I feel like thinking of these legends before her who paved the way is giving her this confidence. When she talks about her friend Sophie, it collapses a little more. We see a little bit more blocking, a little bit more vulnerability. And of course, this is someone she obviously misses, but it's nice to see that shift from confidence to something that makes her feel a little more vulnerable. What a great opportunity here to also talk about something that we see on the channel very often, but in a different context. And it's a verbal leak. If you listen to the speech, very often she's going, um, 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 at the end of her sentences. And it doesn't have this, um, hesitation, like she's looking for her words. That's not what we're seeing. It's just this um, verbal leak. It's like a filler word. Now on the channel, we talk a lot about clusters of deception, behaviors that when they happen at the same time, it indicates that there might be a heightened probability of deception. And we're going to want to dig a little bit more pertaining to that topic. Now, not that she's being deceptive about any of this. I don't see why she'd be lying about anything up there, but I just want you to see how in this case, that verbal leak, which would play into a cluster if other things were happening at the same time is utterly meaningless here. There's nothing else going on with her body language. that's making me go, Oh wait, something weird happened. When that subject came up, something weird happened. You know, maybe a ton of hesitation, a non-answer, refusing to answer, touching the face, you know, blink rate going up, eye blocking. We're not seeing a cluster, just these isolated ums throughout the speech, which in this case is a great example of how it doesn't matter. Um, my mother, um, I grew up uh, next to a highway no, in nowhere, Germany, and my mother believed me that I was a girl and um, I wouldn't be here without her um, and her support. <laughs> okay, we're seeing a very interesting gesture there, or a cluster of gestures, right after she says, my mother believed me that I was a girl. I'm very open about the fact on this channel that body language 
doesn't always give us a clear answer because there are certain things that could be numerous things. And this is a conversation I really want to have because I have a few theories as to what we're seeing. First, let's talk about what the behavior is. So as she's building up towards the end of that sentence, we see eye blocking, her eyes close, and the chin goes down a little bit. So eye blocking, when the eyes close, it's typically when we're trying to either keep thoughts in or keep thoughts out. So it's something when we're focusing on trying to, you know, form a thought, you might see the eyes close as we try to gather our thoughts. And we see this even in children that were born blind. So we know that this is deeply subconscious that we close our eyes to focus. We also do when we're trying to keep something out. Like somebody says something negative, some bad news, and you just don't want to let it in. So we close the eyes like this to not allow that to come in. Naturally, it happens when we are also quite emotional. When we're trying to hold on to an emotion, it might happen with good emotions or again, not letting negative emotions come in. So as she's building up to that sentence, we see the eyes close as she comes down. Already there, I have two theories. One, it could be that she's remembering how touched she was by how accepting her mother was, and she's trying to hold on to that moment. Wouldn't surprise me. And two is she's thinking back to that part of her life where there was probably a lot of people besides her mom who weren't encouraging, and she's kind of trying to keep those thoughts out and stay the course. It could be either one. But there's a real moment of emotion there with that eye blocking as she gets that sentence out. But after the sentence, we see these things happen at the same time. There's a lip compression, the eyebrow flash, the quick eyebrows go up like this as the head tilts, and there's kind of an arm shrug without the shoulders going up, which is very bizarre and strange. Usually when we shrug, so with that cluster, I could expect to see something like, like this kind of thing, but the shoulders don't do that. But if you look at the arms, they pop out like this. Uh, girl, and um, I it's interesting. Is it that she's holding the mic down, so she, it would be hard to get the shoulders up, so the arms go up? I don't really know. But let's look at the rest. We see the lips like this, eyebrow flash, and that head tilt. It's almost a shrug. It kind of looks a little like a shrug, but not entirely. So here are some theories as to what I think might be happening in that moment. The first theory is that there's this pose we often see with women and it, we see it a lot in cartoons, we see it a lot in movies where there's this head tilt with a smile with a bit of a kind of turning the head sideways. Sometimes the shoulders come up a little bit. The hands are often together, whether it's in front or behind the back. And it's kind of this cutesy thing. So I'm thinking it's possible in this moment that it's this kind of cutesy pose where she's seeking approval for that sentence from the audience which would very much explain the eyebrow flash as well. Because eyebrow flashing typically means one of three things, emphasis, social approval, looking for social approval or connection, or surprise. And in that moment, that looks like a eyebrow flash of social approval to me. So maybe it's, you know, I was a girl and she's kind of getting that cutesy pose and looking for that approval from the audience. It's possible. The second theory is quite simply that she tripped the mic and it threw her off. So. We could see that moment where she hits the mic, the mic wobbles a little, so maybe that's why we see her looking down, stumbles on her words a little, her speech slows down because this kind of broke her train of thought, and then she gets the sentence out and it, we just recover from it. And that's kind of like this, we're back on course gesture, possible. But my favorite theory is that she got emotional, which is why we see the eye block, we see her sentence and cadence slow down even before she trips the mic, so I think I like this theory better for that reason. She's getting emotional. She says this sentence and the sentence comes out just a little bit grammatically incorrect. She says, my mother believed me that I was a girl. Not, my mother believed that I was a girl. My mother believed me when I said that I was a girl. My mother believed me that I was a girl. So I think in that moment she says it and she kind of knows that it's not the perfect grammar, but she kind of goes, no, I think they got the point. So I think it might be just a gesture of after the sentence, like, that, that'll do, that's good enough. They get the point, they get what I'm trying to say. So I think it's very likely that. Just this moment of emotion, getting through it, kind of stumbling on her words and going, nah, that's, that's good enough, I'm good with that. But let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, I think it's likely one of these three things. I like the third theory the best, but let me know, what do you think? This is a gesture where, you know, there isn't enough research for me to tell you exactly in this context what it means. So this is somewhere where we could discuss and try to figure out what that meant. All right, now we're gonna move on to Beyonce, Harry Styles, and uh, Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez and see some very different reactions while being positive, very different reactions to what we just saw. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more behavioral analysis and practical psychology content. We are witnessing history tonight. 
breaking the record for the most Grammy wins of all time. Be upstanding and show your respect. It's Renaissance. All right, what a different reaction we're seeing here from the first one. First of all, this is literally history in the making, as James Corden said, because she just broke the record for most Grammys won by one person. That's why the moment he suggests that it's history in the making, we hear the audience cheering and her surrounding stands up and she knows, doesn't have to say it. And we get such a different reaction from what we saw with Kim, where Kim Petras shock, surprise, you know, oh my God. We're not seeing that from Beyonce. We're seeing a very humble smile. Uh, she's done this a billion times. So we just see that smile. She's happy. We're seeing that, but there isn't that moment of shock. Oh my God. She's not overplaying that. And I love that. I love that she's keeping it humble in that moment and not over dramatizing this. Her surrounding stands up. I'm really interested in Jay-Z's reaction because we are seeing right there a classic Duchenne smile. So a Duchenne smile is a genuine smile named after Guillaume Duchenne, who is the researcher who discovered the difference between fake or polite smiles that we do socially and a real genuine smile of happiness in which muscles are engaged. And in a Duchenne smile, we're gonna see the corners of the mouth go up. We see the cheeks rise, often causing a rise here with what I call bubble cheeks over here. And the eyes are very important. The eyes squint and we see these outwards lines next to the eyes. And one real good way to know if a smile is a Duchenne smile is block the mouth. And in this case, if we block Jay-Z's mouth, we can still absolutely tell that he's happy and smiling based on the cheeks and the eyes. So that is a Duchenne smile, obviously very happy for his wife for this amazing accomplishment. With Beyonce, we see her stand up and we see a grooming gesture with both hands. So her hands push her hair back and grooming gestures are anything that we do to fix our appearance when we're about to give a speech or when we're on camera and we're just kind of making sure everything looks good. But more importantly, this is a gesture called ventilating. So whenever we feel stress or anxiety, and this can be good anxiety when you're like feeling a little anxious but, but positive or bad stress, blood rushes to our head, to our, our vital organs, you know, the nose for more oxygen intake. And in that blood rush, often we could feel heat around the head. In fact, a lot of people say that when they're feeling anxious or stressed, they feel that heat in their head. And we ventilate to bring more air to the body. So with men, we might see them adjust their collar like this, but with women, we often see them push their hair out of the way. And here she's doing it on both sides. And immediately after that, we see hand to chest. Both hands go on the chest. And this is something that we do when we're hit with emotion and empathetic people tend to do this gesture quite a lot. When they're told a story and some of friends will, oh my God, I'm so sorry, but hand to chest is something we see very often in empathetic people. And in this case, uh, I feel she's just kind of taking that moment in. It's a very genuine gesture that I'm seeing there. Then she gets on stage and again, before she speaks, we see a couple of things that are consistent with grooming and taking in the moment. So we see her lick the lips. That is classic grooming. It brings more color to the lips before we're about to speak. So we're seeing that right there. Uh, we're seeing the eyes closed. And again, remember what we said earlier, eyes closed is to keep thoughts in. In this case, nothing negative. Obviously it's all positive. She's trying to hold on to that moment, which she's about to say, that's what she's doing. So yeah, overall, just taking this moment in, really living this experience. We're looking at a seasoned pro here. So we're not seeing an enormous amount of stress, obviously a little bit of anxiety, you know, the good butterflies, but overall just, and, and not overplayed. You know, I, I love that about this. It's not overplayed, over dramatized. It's almost like in her humility, we feel how much of a big moment this is. If she overplayed it and made it this big thing, it might seem inauthentic. This looks awesome. I'm trying not to be too emotional. And I'm trying to just receive this night. I want to thank God for protecting me. I'd like to thank my Uncle Johnny, who's not here. but he's here in spirit. All right, not much there. Just someone who's really moved by this moment in her life. Uh, and, and she says in words what her body language was telling us seconds before. That's what I love about body language. 
it lets us know things that are happening before the person even says it. Because she says, I'm just trying to take in this night. But we saw that in that eye block. She's just trying to hold on to this moment. Um, and then she looks at the sky as she talks about her uncle Johnny. And it flashes for a quick second. But we see a face of sadness. It's really quick. And here's the other thing. Because it's likely, now I don't know this for sure, but it's likely that she's had certain cosmetic procedures on her face, we're not going to see the entire expression of sadness. As we look at this speech, those eyebrows, that forehead really aren't moving much. So it's very possible that there were things done up there that are going to limit that movement. But when she talks about Uncle Johnny for a quick sec, go watch it. You could feel that sadness hit for a sec. As she looks up, we see the mouth droop for a quick second, the eyes droop for a quick second, and I have a feeling that the eyebrows would go into sadness, but something's making them not. So, but, but we do still feel for a second as she looks to the sky, Uncle Johnny, we see a quick flash of sadness, looks up to remember her uncle, who, you know, she's, she's remembering, looking towards the heavens, and then down. And downwards is usually, so happy is usually up, we jump up, right? We're on cloud nine, but we feel down, we feel low, with sadder emotion. So she takes a moment there to go from remembering her uncle to that sadness. And it's and look at how it's not overplayed. It's not dramatized. We've looked at a lot of individuals on this channel where they lean into these moments and really try to sell it. Nothing about this is trying to be sold. She's just feeling this moment and she looks down, talks about her uncle, then we see another quick hand to chest as she's feeling that emotion. It's very real. I like to thank my beautiful husband my beautiful three children who are at home watching. I'd like to thank the queer community for your love and for inventing this genre. God bless you. Thank you so much to the Grammys. There is something I love in that moment so much, and it's when Beyonce talks about her husband and the camera cuts to Jay-Z. Now, the typical thing that would happen when someone is mentioned, you know, a spouse or something like that, the camera would cut, the person knows they're on camera and they would kind of turn to the crowd and acknowledge. That's something we see very often. In this case, he doesn't even take that. He doesn't break away from that. This is her moment. He's so proud of her. We see it in his entire demeanor from the moment she gets up to this moment and his focus is entirely on her. It's like he doesn't even want this moment of acknowledgement. I'm sure he's thankful that it's happening, but it's like he's not even breaking away from her for a second. Now we talk on the channel very often about universal emotions and of course the pioneer of universal emotions was Paul Ekman, the researcher who actually traveled to tribes that are completely isolated from society to try to figure out which emotions are completely universal to human beings. Now there is another emotion that Paul Ekman didn't talk about and was actually talked about in completely separate research by researchers Tracy and Robbins. And they discovered that pride is also a universal emotion. In fact, the recognizability rate, in other words, how much people recognize it all over the world, is very, very high up there. People really, really recognize pride universally. And what pride looks like is a bit of a smile, uh, arms akimbo or the arms away from the body because when we're feeling confident or in this case proud we take up quite a bit of space and when we're feeling unconfident we close up so those arms go out a bit of a smile and most importantly that chin is up and the head is tilted back a little bit so the neck is exposed a little and this is something again we do with confidence because exposing the neck is a big vulnerability and when we're feeling self-conscious or a little vulnerable things come inwards so chin up like this is usually very confident and pride and confidence are very related. Now it's no wonder that on a lot of rap albums or posters for rappers, we see that exact cluster. We see those arms by the side, we see the chin up like this, often with a bit of a head tilt and the smile not so much, but you know, we see this kind of pose a lot with rappers. Now in this moment, we're not seeing much of a smile, but if we look at his right eye, it's glistening a little bit. I think he's extremely happy for her. He's really touched by emotion, but in that chin up, we're still seeing that pride. And he's standing quite tall and he's open. He's very proud of his wife in this moment, I believe. All right, now before we move on to Harry Styles and end this video with such a positive wave uh, that I hope it'll just supercharge your weekend, let's look at Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez. So at some point, Trevor Noah is doing this bit where he pretends to be on the phone with his mom and we see them in the background. And Ben Affleck leans over and says something 
and we immediately see a reaction in JLo. She doesn't love what he said because what happens is look at both her hands. One hand goes right to her own knee and holds her down and the other one goes to his knee and holds him down. So it's something along the lines of she's trying to ground them both like maybe something like this isn't the time or stay put or behave or something along those lines. And she turns to him and there's almost at first like a bit of a snappy thing and in that second moment we see her head kind of go forward and then down like this. Like you might see this in a parent telling a kid like come on now you know like this kind of thing and we're seeing exactly that on that second tap so first it's snappy held down and then that tap like this and immediately when she says that he straightens up and he starts grooming himself and we see the eyebrows of either confusion or anger because both look very similar but there is a bit of grumpiness there i would say that you know with concentration usually it's a little more like this, like the bottom face either relaxed or kind of going side to side. But here it almost looks angry and like kind of like, like this kind of thing. And he grooms, he immediately grooms, so he's self-conscious. Something she said made him feel self-conscious and he's straightening up as he says something else to her. So the interaction seems to be overall that he says something that she disapproves of and she turns around and grounds both of them, like this isn't the time, and then kind of softens up as she taps and goes, come on now. And he doesn't like her response to what he said so much because he feels a little offended by that and he starts grooming. We see him straighten his vest, we see him sit up straight, change his posture, he's looking at her maybe with a bit of annoyed confusion or anger, really hard to tell the difference. And then right at the end we see his eyes find the camera and his face relaxes and there's almost a slight hint of a tiny little smile there. And this is a classic expression we see when we're having an unpleasant conversation with someone or maybe a bit of an argument and we realize someone's watching and we just go, <laughs> Nothing, nothing to see here, everything's good, everything's cool. And I think we're getting a little bit of that in that moment. So in my head, in my head, purely speculative, here's the type of conversation this could have been. Here's what I like to think happened. He turned to her and he said something like, God, this sucks, the Oscars are so much cooler. And she was like, stay calm, this is not the time. And he was like, God, I didn't say anything, geez. So it's, that's what I'm imagining in my head. Now for news sources and blogs who cover my videos, please don't take that literally and write an article about how I'm saying that's the conversation that happened. It's not. And this wasn't the only time where it seemed like there wasn't great symmetry between the two of them. There were numerous times where the camera cut to them and they just seemed out of sync. Like there's one scene where JLo's dancing and Ben Affleck is standing there with the exact same energy that I had every time my mom would drag me with her to her errands when I was young. And then there's another scene where we see them sitting down and uh, they're each kind of bobbing to the music, but notice how out of sync they are. Usually when we're connected to someone, we mirror their gestures and we're usually moving with pretty good synchronicity. And there were numerous times throughout this evening where they just fell out of sync. So what does this mean? Does it mean that JLo and Ben Affleck are over and their relationship is in the rocks and oh my God, they're gonna break up soon. No, it, I mean, look, it can mean that, it's possible, but I think it's a really far cry. Which couple doesn't have? these little bickering moments. The difference is most couples don't have a million people looking at them uh, every second of the day. So it's very normal to have these little kind of quick spats and little disagreements or being out of sync. Look, this is her world. She's at an event, the Grammys, she's in the music world, he's not, so he's here to encourage her to be with her. And so I think it's normal that there's gonna be moments where he's not as into it as she is. Don't think it's a big deal, could be, but doesn't necessarily indicate that. You can read it. Harry Styles! Oh, what a beautiful moment. I love this moment. And I pride myself usually in my analysis for being you know, neutral or unbiased, but I'm gonna be biased in this case because although I had no strong opinions of Harry Styles before I saw this, I have such a hard time believing that somebody who would take the time to do what he did in that moment is not genuinely a really, really kind person. So let's look at his reaction. Um, immediately as it's announced, we see what we saw with Kim Petras and Beyonce times a million. So with Beyonce, we saw that eye blocking as she's trying to hold on to this moment. And with Kim Petras, we saw the mouth open and the hands come up to block it. So 
Here in this case, we're seeing both hands come up and just block everything. The eyes, the mouth, everything. So if we go back to what I said earlier with how when we are feeling vulnerable or we're displaying an emotion, we might bring our hands up to block that so that we don't display our vulnerability. Well, this is that to the millionth degree. Plus we have that eye block with, it's not just that the eyes are blocked with the eyes, but the hands are coming on top of the eyes like this. So it's like an eye block plus putting a chain around it and a padlock. So it's really trying to savor this moment at the same time trying to block this moment of emotion and both hands up like this to cover the entire face happens in extreme moments of emotion. And it could be on all sides of that emotional spectrum. So it could be like in extreme moments of happiness, like something hits you and you just can't believe it. Oh my God, how happy you are. Or it could be in moments of sadness. Like if something's really sad, you might go in like this. And it's, it's a lot of things. It's closing those eyes to either once again, hold on to this moment or keep something out, really out. And at the same time, you're hiding your face because of that vulnerability. So again, it's what we saw with Beyonce's eye block. It's what we saw with Kim Petras's mouth block, but times a thousand where everything is being blocked. And I think there's elements here of trying to hold on to this moment, but at the same time, oh my God, this is unbelievable. And trying to hide that emotion because subconsciously it's a vulnerability and we just need a second. I think that's what we're seeing there 110%, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is what happens when he gets on that stage. So there's this mega super fan of his on stage um, and Trevor Noah gives her the honor of announcing it. And we could see her, she stammers as she says that, she's excited. And what does he do when he gets on stage? It's so touching. He makes this woman's day, year, month, life. He runs right up to her with this big exciting, like arms extended, runs straight for her, gives her a nice, big, it's not even a hug, it's an embrace. He holds her, he dances with her, he celebrates with her. It's not this dismissive, you know, thanks homie, grab the Grammy, this is what's important. The importance is 0% on the award that he just won, which is a massive honor. It's all about giving her this moment. It's so touching. He holds on to her, dances with her, and even when he breaks away from that, he doesn't care. You know, he has to give a speech, he's talking to her, he's acknowledging her, his hand is still on her. He hasn't broken away. There's nothing in his body language that's saying, I'm just doing this to get away from it. M hundreds of other performers would have gone up there, given a hug, taken the Grammy, thank you so much, walked away, and that would have been fine. I would have never criticized that. But he goes above and beyond to put the focus on this lady. It's so wholesome. Man, um, I've been so, so inspired by every artist in this category with me at a lot of different times in my life. I listen to everyone in this category when I'm alone. And I think like on nights like tonight, it's obviously so important for us to remember that there is no such thing as best in music. Um, and then he speaks, right? So now he gave this moment to this woman, took the attention off himself, gave this moment to this woman. Now he comes up to the microphone and Notice how the Grammy isn't on display. It's not here. He's not like, look at what I did. It's off to the side and we're seeing the underside of it. And then he starts to speak. And the first thing he says, we didn't see it there, but he says, shit, like, you know, having a hard time believing this. But then he immediately starts to talk about the other artists in the category. And he says, at some point in my career, I listened to their music. And it's important to remember that in this kind of thing, there are no winners. And it's so pure, it's so humble, how he's putting the focus, like up until this point, from the moment it was announced, or he started his speech, he hasn't put the focus on himself for one second. It went from uh, that woman to the other nominees. And I think almost anyone in this position would take this, start thanking people, you know, really take this moment for themselves. And I think that's totally normal. I think any of us would do that. But for him, it's just so humble that he's extending that back towards the nominees. All right, now I'm gonna give you guys a bit of a peek behind the curtain of my life as a mentalist. So basically a mentalist is a magician who focuses more on psychological type tricks, things that make it seem like we can read your thoughts and we know things about you and we know details about your life and we know the passcode for your phone and all these crazy types of things. And we do readings, a lot of the time we do readings. And these readings might seem like psychic readings, but the main difference is that mentalists are usually very open about the fact that we're using trickery and psychology. Most mentalists are quite open about that. Now, there's something that as a mentalist, I study, that I teach, 
And that is a very big part of behavioral analysis and we don't talk about it enough on the channel and I think we should. And that thing is called profiling. So profiling is looking at someone's decisions, the way they conduct themselves, the way they speak, the way they move, certain things about their appearance and understand certain things about how their mind works. Now interrogators use profiling all the time to adjust the way they communicate with someone to make it more effective to communicate with that person. And I use this in interviews all the time and I use it in my mentalism. I have certain scripts, there are certain profiles I look for and I present those scripts in my readings and people go, oh my God, how can you know that about me? Now there are a lot of profiling systems out there uh, put together by communications experts, interrogation experts, psychology experts. Uh, one that's very popular that a lot of you talk about in the comments is the Briggs-Myers uh, system. One of my favorites is uh, Chase Hughes' Six Minute X-Ray. I'll leave a link in the description. His book describes his profiling system and it's freaking incredible. But one thing that I teach, and this isn't my whole profiling system, but it's a really interesting thing that I use in my mentalism, is the idea that every human on this planet is a collector. We all collect something. And there are four types of collectors. There are those who collect objects and things. There are those who collect knowledge and information. There are those who collect people, and it's not as creepy as it sounds. We'll get back to that in just a second. And then there are those who collect moments and experiences. And I could typically very quickly spot which of those someone falls into, and I have a script for each one that I say in my readings, and typically it lands pretty good. So what are these things? They're pretty self-explanatory. The first one is people who collect things and objects. People who put a lot of value on acquisitions. So this is the person you're gonna see with the big fancy watch, the big fancy car, usually dressed, you know, in, in very flashy or, or, you know, obvious brand names. They often talk about also things that they bought, things that they acquired, so I have a script for that. Then the second one is those who, um, collect knowledge and information. So these are the ones who are always willing to learn, always sharing links to things and reading things, newspapers, vlogs, you know, paying attention to expanding their knowledge. Then we have a third one, people who collect people. I know it's a weird terminology, but this is um, people who love to connect, whether it's with groups, whether it's with individual people, they, they concern themselves with people, empaths often fall into this group. Um, but even in their conversation, you might hear about you know, I was having this conversation with such and such person or I was at such and such event. So it's about who they know uh, and, and they kind of really place a lot of value on social circles. And finally, people who um, really value experiences and moments. So the material isn't important to them. People are obviously important to these people as well if they're part of that experience. But these people put so much value on experience, moments that take your breath away, individual unique things that they can experience. And these people are often, they have this very laid back chill vibe. Now as actual examples of how I use this information, here are um, two scripts that I've used actually in mentals and performances. The first one is for someone that I immediately recognize as someone who collects experiences. I could just tell from the way she was reacting to the show. And the second one is someone that I spotted who collects knowledge. So both of these scripts are because I noticed that and I just spit out the script and, and you'll see how it turns out. I also do believe, somebody used the word minimalist before, I do believe you are, I believe you appreciate the small things in life, like moments, experiences rather than tangible things. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, you thought of something that connects you sentimentally to someone, you've had this for a very long time? Yeah. <laughs> and it's not new, like if I look at it, it's not a new thing. It's taken some damage. Yeah, I want to go now. No, no, you said, you said, you said. Yes. And, and you feel because there's, you have this ability to understand things pretty quickly, and sometimes you get impatient trying to explain it to people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, and all this to say, all that, I thought you would have fun with that a little bit to start noticing these things. That was one reason that I wanted to talk about that. But another reason is because Harry Styles, is 100% one of these four things. And I wonder if you can guess which one it is. So off the top of your head, you could pause the video and go comment and then see if you got it right. Or you can just right now in your head, try to decide what do you think um, Harry Styles is? Does he collect things and objects? Does he collect people, knowledge and information, or moments and experiences? What does he collect? And the answer is moments and experiences, 100%. And of course, people as well plays part of that because he puts, 
importance on people because he acknowledges their experience. Like for example, when he went on that stage, he was immediately conscious of the fact that he can make this a night that that woman will remember for the rest of her life. So he gave her that experience. But as we look at the way he speaks about this moment, it's all about this moment, this experience. The tangible, the award itself is meaningless. He even says, there is no best. Like, as much as this is a great distinction, there is no best. And then he says this. I don't think any of us sit in the studio thinking, making decisions based on what is going to get us one of these. So again, look at that focus on it's not about the tangible, it's not about the material, it's about the experience of writing music and what it means to him. So this is such a classic example of somebody who collects experiences and moments. Now, although I love using this collector's thing in my mentalism to have those scripts and have people go, oh my God, he's in my head and then go on to you know, reveal more things about them that I can't know, um, it has a lot more uses outside of that. So if you're not a performer, uh, in day-to-day -day communication. So when we spot these things in people, it helps us adjust to know how to talk to them. So if I spot someone who collects objects or things, I know to talk to them about certain things that they have and say, oh, that's a really unique uh, watch you have. Tell me about that. But when you see someone who collects moments and experiences, you might ask them to tell you about a trip that they took or tell you about a unique thing that they experienced and they will connect with you a lot more through that. And instead of you sharing with them, you know, something you learned or some information you gained, you can tell them about a unique experience. So it helps us adjust our communication and I think it's super valuable uh, whether you want to go blow minds as a mentalist or you want to improve the way you communicate with people. And I think that's a great way to end with that, this really awesome takeaway value. And you could start noticing out there in the real world who collects what. All right, there it was. Definitely a big roller coaster on this one. Actually, a lot of highs, mostly, mostly positive stuff. A lot of great different reactions to the same thing that we saw there. You know, with Beyonce a little bit more calm, trying to savor the moment. Uh, with, with Kim, we had this big surprise. With, with Harry's super emotional moment and just immediately putting the focus on everyone except for himself. So that was really incredible. Hope you enjoyed this one. Hope you enjoyed dabbling a little bit into the profiling. Let me know what you thought about that and if you guys want to learn a little bit more about profiling on the channel, I would love to talk about it. I do it all the time as a mentalist. Let me know in the comments and I will see you on the next one.